if your family is like mine, but when somebody comes to our door that we're not expecting, like a salesperson going through the neighborhood, or maybe you can tell by the way they're dressed, they want to have a religious conversation with me, and I'm not interested in that. At our house, I, I realize I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to want to engage in those kind of conversations, but we're like diving behind the couch. You know, it's like, whoop, nobody home. Do they hear the music? No, that music is just because we want people to think we're home, but we're actually not. I mean, we are hiding. And I don't know if you guys work that way, but we sure do. It just, you know, today's day and age, I've just discovered that most people coming to my door do not have anything that I'm interested in buying or that I'm interested in hearing. I mean, even just the shift of the culture over the last few decades where so much of what we do is online now, right? Like even our shopping, our research about different items, where it used to be somebody would come to our door and maybe actually have some helpful information for us. Now it's like, man, it's right at fingertips. Amazon Prime changed my life. You know, it's like, woo, two days and it's on my doorstep and I can have anything I want. Well, here's what I've noticed, though. This same kind of mentality that's moving us away from face-to-face conversations really begins to pop up in other areas of life. In fact, the other day I was going to buy a new suit. I'm going to be doing a wedding here in about a month. And uh, my only suit was from the 90s. It was like what I bought when I graduated college to go to interviews. And it's like MC Hammer pants and like really baggy. I mean, just straight 90s fashion for those of you that remember that. And so when I put it, I had to put it on the other day for an event and I looked like a clown. So I was like, no, I cannot wear this for a wedding. So I went to the mall to get a new suit. And when I walked in, I was even a little kind of awkward feeling because this person was trying to be very helpful, but I'm so used to doing everything online now that to actually have somebody come and take my measurements and talk to me about the different suits was an odd experience. It was like, can I trust you? I mean, are you just trying to sell me the suit or do you really know what you're talking about? Because I'm used to six different websites telling me the best brand and the best thing to look into. So to take somebody's word for something today is just so, so difficult. And yet, We live in a time where Jesus has said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. The translation being that you will be my hands and feet. You will take the love that you've experienced from me and you will be my mouthpiece to a world that has never heard. So how do we do that, church? How do we do that in a day and age where we dive behind the couch when someone comes to knock on the door or even going to the store to be fitted for a suit is kind of this awkward experience because we're used to all of our interactions being through a screen. How do we press in in a a day and age where uh, personal contact, sharing story, actually talking about the deeper things of life tends to not be as easy as maybe it once was? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. We're in a series called Who's Your One, where we're uh, re-kind of affirming that God has called us to be those that go out, that we wouldn't just live in a holy huddle inside of a church building, but that we would take the good news of Jesus with us into the highways, into the byways, wherever he's going, we're going, and that we would be his mouthpiece. Now, I don't know about you, but I've really had some bomb experiences of trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I was thinking about this in preparation for this message of just some of the most awkward experiences I've ever had trying to share the love of Jesus with someone. And one of the ones that just so painful comes to mind was we were in Germany planning a church, and we had been there long enough for me to have a little bit of language knowledge, and I was ready to kind of go out and say, okay, today's the day I'm going to share the gospel with somebody in German. And so I went to a university in the middle of the city. It's kind of a, it's a high-ranked university, very intelligent student body. And I thought, I'll go around lunchtime. Maybe the students will be out, you know, having lunch or whatever. And we had worked with a bunch of college students in Texas. So this is natural. I love college students. And I found some sitting in a circle on the ground. And so I just kind of went up and plopped down and, hey, guys, how's it going? And I think initially they were intrigued, you know, this Texan guy who knows a little bit of German, but he's got a funny American accent. And, you know, what, what does he want? And so we had some initial good conversation. But then I began to try to throw in things about Jesus and did they know God and did they ever go to church? And slowly they just, their body language began just kind of turning away from me. And all of a sudden I realized they're talking amongst themselves and their backs are turned to me and I'm having a conversation by myself over here right now. So I just stood up and said, bye guys. And I just walked home and I just thought that was terrible. Like, you know, anybody that's given me money to come here to plant a church is going to want all their money back. That was horrible. But it was one of those moments where I realized God has called us to be prepared to share our story. 
and to be prepared in season and out of season to talk about with others what God has done in our own hearts. And so I needed to find a way to overcome that awkwardness. I needed to find a way to find my way, my natural way, because everybody has a natural way that they work, and I'm going to talk about some of those in a moment, my natural way of getting into conversations with people. But I went back to Scripture and just was, again, kind of reaffirmed by this idea of being prepared And it says to us in 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, Preach the word, Timothy. Be prepared in season and out of season as well. And then the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, he says, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be, and this word again, prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. As I... Remember those verses after this awkward experience on this college campus in Berlin. I just thought, Lord, I, I want to be better prepared. I, I want to be able to not uh, cause embarrassment to you. Okay, it's a little awkward for me, but I, I would never want these kids, 4 million people in this city, less than 1% of them know you in an intimate way, a relationship with you. This might have been their only chance to hear from a, a Jesus follower about what I've experienced. I don't want to blow that again. So what can I do? What can I learn? And God kind of took me on a journey, and we're going to get actually very practical today because I want to give you guys some tools that you can take out of here. You're going to practice in your life groups this week, but we want you to be able to identify maybe your natural way of entering into a Jesus conversation with someone and then sharing your story and then sharing the story of Jesus and his goodness. So that's kind of where we're going today. Now, as growing up, I kind of I had this modeled for me, which I'm so grateful for. My parents uh, worked on staff at a large church in Florida, and so I just was brought up in church, and we went on mission trips places. And I remember watching people share their faith, and I was amazed at some of the different ways that that played out. You know, people stand up in front of a large group and and share the gospel. And in fact, my dad uh, was a minister of music. They had over 400 people in his choir and an orchestra as well. And they took all of those people over to the UK, and uh, we did this massive uh, kind of production with music and everything. And then our pastor stood up and shared the gospel. And I remember hundreds of people actually giving their lives to Jesus. And I was like, man, that's amazing. I would love to be able to share share my faith like that. I've also experienced it kind of in small group settings where we went on a mission trip to New Orleans when I was kind of just getting into middle school age and we were working down near the French Quarter kind of doing a vacation Bible school with the kids that lived there in the inner city of New Orleans and it was so much fun getting to know them and just having fun and playing games and then we would have a Jesus element of that of sharing about the goodness of God and what we had encountered in God and, and entering into friendships with them. And in fact, one of the kids, I, I, we became such good friends. We talked a lot about music, and I found out that he liked MC Hammer, and I liked MC Hammer. Again, back to MC Hammer. That's why I had the baggy suit. Anyway, uh, so I, we actually made an effort to go back after our team had left. My parents drove me back down to his neighborhood, and I went to his house, and I was like, hey, man, I just had so much fun hanging out with you. I wanted to give you my MC Hammer tape. Jesus loves you, you know, in my sixth grade way of saying MC Hammer and Jesus, hey, there's something out there. I hope that our connection with one another made a difference in that kid's life. I have no idea what, where he went on to be, what, what God might have done, but I was grateful to be invited into a conversation, a gospel conversation as we got to know one another over that week. And who knows, maybe that gesture of me showing back up and I I had heard him, that he loved a particular kind of music and I happened to have a cassette tape of that same kind of music. Maybe that bridged a gap. Maybe that caused him to wonder, these Jesus people, is there more to it than what I may have, have assumed about it? Because we had to connect. How about you? What are some different ways that you've been able to interact with one another, with others that maybe didn't know your journey of meeting Jesus. You see, here's what we know. The, the vast majority of us in this room that have decided to follow Jesus, you did so because one other person invested in you. It might have been a parent. It might have been a sibling, brother, sister. It might have been a coworker. But somewhere along the line, somebody said, hey, I'd love to share with you my story of how God changed my life. Or I'd love to invite you to this event that's happening at our church, or maybe it was a Billy Graham crusade in a football stand, or wherever somebody invited you, and because they reached out to you, you had the, uh, the ability or the, the privilege of getting to hear about God's love for you, and your life was changed. But so often, sadly, we end up going through that experience and then not passing that on to someone else. We just kind of get comfortable, and this is all of us guys, we just, we kind of get into the rhythm, and we do the church thing on the weekend, and then it's on with our life the rest of the week, forgetting that there's hundreds of thousands of people that have never heard the good news of Jesus. 
Some of you might actually be in this room. Maybe you're in this room and you're thinking, this is kind of weird. What's he talking about? It's like some multi-level marketing scheme we're like getting into here. What's he, we're supposed to bring a message to other people. And I just want to know, you to know if you're here today and you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, we're so glad that you're here. In fact, we want this church to be a place where wherever you are on the journey, young kid just trying to figure it out, our older adult uh, here in this room, that we're family and that you can come on a journey and you can kick the tires on faith and you can poke holes a little bit and figure out what this Jesus story is actually all about. So the fact that you're here today, we just want you to know we're glad. And I hope that as we share a little bit about what God has done in our life and why we would want to share that with others, maybe there'll be a piece of that that will make sense and click for you today. Well, I've shared that I've had the opportunity to, to share the Jesus with different individuals at different times. I remember being in Juarez, Mexico one time on a mission trip as a college student, and we went across the border from El Paso, and we're in Juarez, and as we were out kind of sharing the gospel, this gang shows up, and they gather around us, and they're all looking at us like they want to beat us up, and I remember thinking, oh, no, <laughs> yeah. okay, I read stories about people being stoned for Jesus. This is about it, I guess. I bet we're about to take it. And then this amazing thing happened where we did a, a little drama, and then we got to stand up and begin to share the good news of Jesus through a, through a translator. And some of these gang members began to actually cry, began to get tears in their eyes, and we invited them. If they wanted to know the love of God, if they wanted to walk away from a life of crime and a life of hurt and a life of pain and enter into a relationship with Jesus, we'd love to have a conversation. And some of them in that moment, some of them scoffed at us, but others came close, and we actually knelt down in the dirt of a street right there in Juarez, and to watch Jesus change hearts in that way, it's, man, it is, it is crazy addicting to watch God do what only God can do. One of the things I've learned is this has nothing to do with us. It's nothing about my wise words or your wise words or some story that you might share. It has everything to do with you being faithful to open your mouth and just to say, hey, here's how I've encountered Jesus. Here's what he did in my life, and then the Holy Spirit draws hearts that he's been working on. Have you ever encountered that? Have you ever experienced risking your reputation, risking stepping out at work, risking stepping out at school and saying, hey, I love Jesus. We had a conversation with one of our kids uh, this past week where she was going to be able to give a presentation in school. And one of her deals was she was supposed to talk about her name and her middle name is Elizabeth. And we gave her that uh, as a biblical name. And she said, I feel like I'm supposed to say that our family loves Jesus, but I'm a little nervous about that. And so to have that conversation and say, hey, I totally understand why you'd be nervous, but it's okay to be proud of who you are and who mommy and daddy are. And so we prayed together and to watch her get up and be bold and say, you know, here's my name and we love Jesus as a family and to come home and celebrate and milkshakes. And that's how we celebrate <laughs> Chick-fil-A milkshake, man. That's it. That's right. Way to go. Um, are you doing that as a family? Are you having those kind of conversations? I can tell you guys that it's not always easy, uh, but it is life-changing for yourself and for others. I was reading a story about a pastor who talked about how sometimes it's just a slow-going process. It's not always an immediate thing that happens in someone else's life. And so are you willing to stay the course with someone and to press in over a long period of time? And as he shared the story, he said that uh, Wednesday morning was trash day in his neighborhood. So Tuesday night was uh, 9 o'clock, roll the trash can to the street night. His duty was trash can duty. And so every Tuesday night, about 9 o'clock, he'd be taking the trash can out. And he eventually noticed a neighbor across the street was on the same kind of clock that he was. So Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, was when they would see each other. And, you know, they'd waved at each other, mowing the grass and that kind of thing before. But eventually, the 9 o'clock trash can uh, meeting turned into, hey, how you doing? And walking across the street and shaking hands and introducing themselves. And, hey, you know, what do you do for a living? And this particular pastor said, well, I'm a pastor of a, of a local church here in town. And the guy, we'll call him Bob, the neighbor, just kind of laughed. And he said, well, <laughs> well man... I'll never, I'm never going to come to your place of work. I don't really have much to do with God. And uh, this pastor said, well, you know, what, what do you do for a living? He said, well, uh, I sell cars. And the, the pastor just kind of laughed and said, well, I don't make enough money to buy a new car, so I won't come to your place of business either, so we're good. And they just kind of had this back and forth joking relationship as they built rapport with one another. Eventually, the pastor said, hey, man, I'd love to invite you to one of our Christmas services. And Bob just kind of laughed, man, you know I'm not a church guy. And uh, this kind of went on and on and on for months. Eventually, January comes around, and it's freezing cold outside, and this pastor's rolling his trash can out 9 o'clock at night. He's thinking, I'm going to get out and get back. Doesn't have a coat on, but when he gets out to the end of the driveway, Bob is out there waiting on him and says, hey, neighbor, I need to talk to you. 
came to your church for Christmas, and it was amazing. Thanks so much for inviting us. And the pastor just was like, what? You were there? And he's like, yeah, man, absolutely. And don't worry. We'll be back next year. So, <laughs> so he was like, amen, you know? So just kept loving on the guy. And the next year, the, the guy came back. He came back at Christmas, and he said, my neighbor almost broke his arm patting himself on the back because he said, we're going to raise our attendance 100% this year. We'll be there at Easter also. So the guy came twice to church that following year, and this kind of went on and on for a, a few years, actually. But there didn't seem to be quite much movement going on in his heart. It would kind of be, hey, great, great job on Easter, great job at Christmas. And then one Sunday morning after church, this pastor had invited those that wanted to be baptized to meet him after church for a little meeting. They were going to go through the details of the baptism service. And he looks up, and he sees Bob coming from the back of the room to sit down at the front totally shocked. He was like, what's Bob doing? <laughs> Finishes the meeting, walks over to his neighbor and was like, Bob, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I didn't want to tell you. I was a little embarrassed, but we've been slipping in the back of church the last couple of weeks. And a week ago, I gave my life to Jesus, man. God's changed my life and, and I want to be baptized. And the pastor said his jaw just hit the floor because this has been months and years. I'm just rolling a trash can to the end of the street. Hey, Bob, how you doing? How's your family? Any way I can be praying for you? being the hands and feet over the long haul, not willing to just give up, not willing to say, well, I tried, I did my bit, Lord, now it's over to you. But that faithful persistence to just say, hey, man, let me give you an invitation. Have you done that? Have you ever reached out to someone just in your way, extroverted way, introverted way, group of people way, one-on-one -on -one way, however God's made you, have you taken a risk? And have you stayed the course? Do you know who your one is. Unfortunately, I found that in the church, as I said, as I said many times, we like to, man, we love to get the benefits of Jesus, but then we just get a little comfortable. It just feels so good that we're just like, well, let's just, let's just kind of sit here. This is great. Kind of like sit around the bonfire, sing kumbaya. This is, this is awesome. But Jesus always intended to send us out. And that's why he said, the verse that I have quoted many times is he said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. But I read recently a story that a man wrote, uh, uh, it's an allegory, if you will, of fishermen who decided to become fishermen but never went out to fish. And I'd love to read you this story. Now, it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And there were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes filled with fish. And the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, year after year, those who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish the abundance of fish and how they might go about fishing. And year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means and they defended fishing as an occupation and declared that fishing is always to be the primary task of a fisherman. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing and new and better definitions of fishing. They created witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful banners. And these fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. And the plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. Only one thing, they did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board to send out fishermen to other places where there were many fish. The board hired staff and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, to defend fishing, and to decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and the committee members did not fish. Large and elaborate, expensive training centers were built, those original, whose original primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. Over the years, courses were offered on the needs of fish, the nature of fish, where to find fish, the psychological reactions of fish, and how to approach and feed the fish. And those who taught had doctorates in fishology, but the, doc, but the, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught fishing. Year after year, after tedious training, many graduated and were given fishing licenses. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some to distant waters, which were filled with fish, Many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and sent to fish. But like the fishermen back home, they never fished. They engaged in all kinds of other occupations. Some felt their job was to relate to the fish in a good way. So the fish would know the difference between a good and a bad fisherman. Others felt that simply letting the fish know that they were nice, land-loving neighbors and how loving and kind they were was enough. Now it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and put up with all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day. They received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs and the fact that they claimed to be fishermen yet never fished. 
Imagine how hurt some were when one day a person suggested that those who don't fish are really not fishermen, no matter how much they claim to be. Yet it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year he never fishes? More plainly stated, is one really following if he isn't fishing? Guys, when I read that, I was just convicted yet again of how easy it is. It's just the gravitational pull of church family life to enjoy the benefits of being a part of a Jesus-loving community, but to forget those that are outside, to forget that we were once in their shoes. And someone decided to not just talk about fishing, but to be a fisherman and came and shared their experience with Jesus with us. And in doing so, invited us into a life-changing experience of following Jesus. And if it hadn't been for that person, we wouldn't be in the room in the first place. Who's your one? Are you going out to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to where God has you? And are you thinking about those that are far from God? And are you preparing yourself in season and out of season, to give an account for the hope that you have on the inside of you. Well, I want to submit to you that there's different ways that we do this. There's not just kind of one way. We're not going to kind of sign you all up to be door-to-door salesmen, because if we did, it would bomb horribly, and you would end up like I did with the college students there in Berlin, feeling awkward and probably a door slammed in your face. Some people are actually great at one-on-one conversations. You would do excellent at that. I think about uh, Peter, for instance, the the disciple. Uh, He stood up on the first day of the church at Pentecost, and he preached a sermon on that day, and it said that over 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. There was an anointing on his life on his words, that he was able to communicate the story of Jesus in such a way that people said, I want that. I want to be a part of that. I think about men like Billy Graham, who had that same gifting. Fill stadiums full of people and could proclaim the gospel. It's someone has reckoned that millions of people have heard the gospel uh, message, the good news of Jesus through Billy Graham's preaching. And we know of hundreds of thousands that have said, I came to know Jesus at a Billy Graham crusade. Some have that gifting, and maybe you're one in this room that has the gifting of a Peter. Some of you are like the Apostle Paul. Paul loved a little small group context. He would come into a new city and he would go to the local synagogue and he would sit down and the synagogue was a place of debate and discussion and where people threw out new ideas and Paul would enter into the synagogue and he would enter into discussion and he would uh, proclaim the truth about who Jesus was and many people had never heard about Jesus and he would talk about their gods and he would say, hey, this is how you understand God. Let me show you how Jesus makes sense of the gods that, that you worship and in that setting, that small group setting, A life group setting, a a small group of 10 to 12 people is where Paul's strengths came out. Maybe that's your, maybe that's your strength. I know that that is eventually where I found my particular strength. We were in Berlin again and just trying to figure out how to share the love of Jesus with people. And we decided to invite a group of folks over to our apartment for dinner and a discussion around the big questions of life and of faith, which of course is about Jesus. And so we put it on a little website and we had folks, some friends that we had made, and we were inviting them all over. We ended up with a room full of people. Only one of them was a follower of Jesus beforehand. Uh, He had kind of walked away from God, grew up in southern Germany, was now a student living in Berlin, and his mom saw that we were going to run an alpha course in our apartment. She saw it online. She says to her son, hey, you need to go to these people's apartment. And so literally, we sh- these people show up at our house, many of them we had never met before, and we sat around and we have discussions about who is Jesus and why did he die. And I remember that first night, we, I give the talk, who is Jesus? And then we have a discussion around it. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. They're looking at me like those college students that had turned their back on me on the campus. And I was like, oh, this is not going good. But at the end of the night, I was like, well, hey, guys, thanks so much for coming tonight. We, we hope you'll come back next week. We're going to continue the conversation. And um, what was interesting is we have a meal before we get into discussions. And my wife was cooking those meals. This was a team effort. And they looked at me and they said, Van, this Jesus stuff sounds pretty crazy. But it was somewhat interesting, but really the big deal is your wife's a great cook, so we'll be back next week just for the meal. And so as I jokingly have said, our whole ministry in Berlin was hanging uh, by a thread of my wife's cooking at that point, but they came back, and they came back again the next week, and sitting in that circle, we watched God do the work in their hearts where in our clumsy German and kind of trying to just do our best to share our story, we watched a miracle happen where people in that circle gave their lives to Jesus. And at the end of that alpha course, we went out to a lake and we were able to baptize some of them who not only decided to follow Jesus, but wanted to go public with that. And then they would invite their friends to the next alpha course. And then they would invite their friends to the next one. And we ended up with a little church plant that was beginning to grow because God had helped us find our niche 
The same way that Apostle Paul would sit in a circle with those and have conversation, that was our particular niche. Maybe that's yours. Maybe you're like the blind man in Scripture. The blind man had an encounter with Jesus where Jesus healed him. And uh, he was healed on the Sabbath, which you weren't supposed to do. And so the religious leaders were upset that he had gotten healed on the Sabbath. Crazy, I know, but that's what had happened. And so they began to interview everyone. Who's this man's parents? And they, you know, was this, a, is this fake? Did this really happen? And the parents said, no, no, he, he's our son. He, he was born blind, but don't ask us about how he got healed. They didn't want to get in trouble. And so they go to the blind man. Well, tell us, if you were blind and now you can see, what happened? And I, I love his response. He says, look, I don't know, right? It was like, don't ask me about the theology of it. Don't ask me about the rules and the regulations of it. All I know is I was blind and now I can see and I'm happy about it, right? And so they just, why are you asking me these questions? Almost annoyed that they would ask him the question. But that was his story. It's like, hey, here's where I was in life. I was blind. I was a beggar. I had no hope, no future. And then I met Jesus, and Jesus changed everything for me. And now I can see, now there's meaning and purpose in my life. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you're not great at speaking to people. Maybe you're not going to pull a group of people together in a small group. But maybe just your story of, man, you'll never believe how broken our marriage was. And then Jesus. Hey, man, you'll never understand how deep an addiction I was. And then I met Jesus. I don't know about what you're facing today, but Jesus can change everything. Is your story like the blind man? Is that how God would use you? Maybe some of you are like Matthew. Matthew was one of the disciples of Jesus, but he was a tax collector before that, which means he was not a good guy. He, he was probably stealing from people. Tax collectors not only collected taxes, but they put a little bit in their pocket. So they got rich off of the poor in the city, but Jesus would call Matthew to follow him. And Matthew ended up hosting parties at his house where he would invite those that were far from God and those that were disciples of God, and they would just have a party. In fact, this is such a cool element of scripture. Many churches that I'm aware of around the nation, around the world now, do what they call Matthew parties based on how Matthew did this. Matthew was a great host. He liked to have a good time. He'd also encounter Jesus. And so he'd say, come to my house for dinner. Come hang out. And in that setting of those that were far from God and those that were followers of God over a dinner conversation, he would be able to introduce people to Jesus. Maybe you're a man or a woman that's just like, man, we need to have some Matthew parties at our house in the neighborhood. We like to host people. We like to have a good time. A Matthew party might be a great idea for you. Maybe you're the woman at the well. The woman at the well had this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus read her mail. He told her everything that had happened in her life, and she was like, whoa, how do you know this about me? This incredible encounter, so much so that changed her. So she goes back into the city, and she begins to tell everybody, come and see this guy. He told, he told me everything there is to know about my life. I don't know how he knew it, but he knew everything about my life. And so her invitation was just, come and see. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to take my word for it. Just, just come. Just let me give you an invitation to come and meet this Jesus. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're an invitation giver. Come to a Christmas service. Come to this men's event coming up. Is that your way? Is that your way of, of getting into a Jesus conversation with someone? Those are just a few of the ways. I'm sure there's many more based on your personality and based on your background. But do you know your style? Do you know the way that God has made you to be able to share the good news of Jesus with others? Well, here's what we know again. This is the bottom line is that they will not hear unless we go. God in his infinite wisdom set this thing up that we are sent out to be his hands and feet. Romans 10, 14 to 15 says this. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Guys, this is the blow away of all blow aways. Jesus himself, I mean, God incarnate came and lived among us and then said, and guys, here's my plan A. Like there's no plan B. There's nothing to fall back on. Everything's in this basket. I'm going to start something called the church. That's you guys, okay? And I'm going to leave. I'm going to go back to the Father. And what you're supposed to do, I'm going to give you my spirit. I just want you to keep doing what we've been doing, loving on people, praying for the sick, sharing your experiences with me, and then inviting those that are far from me to come close to me. Go have at it. Tell them how much I love them. Tell them how much I desire to have a relationship with them. And so for 2,000 years, 
We, the followers of Jesus, have been sent ones, sent to go out into the highways and the byways, all the while Jesus knowing they will not hear unless we take the invitation to go and to be fishermen of men and of women. Are you going out? Are you sharing your faith? Well, here's what I want to do. We're going to kind of end today with our remaining time just getting very practical. If knowing your style, large group, small group, one-on-one, Hey, come and see. Hey, come to our house for a dinner party. Whatever it looks like for you, what do you do when you actually get to the moment where somebody says, so what's all this Jesus stuff about? All right, yeah, 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 you go to church. Yeah, you talk to me about Jesus, but boil it down for me, man. Like, what is the, what is the core of this deal? Why are you so into this thing? And so I want to very practically give you what, what I call the four points of the gospel. And the gospel just means good news. So if you were to end up in a conversation with someone about Jesus, you'll be equipped with this to take it and to share it with somebody else. And so my experience in Germany where we were kind of all over the place and kind of fumbling around and then going into scripture and saying, we are to be prepared in season and out of season to give a testimony of the hope that we have on the inside of us. I said, God, I need to get that into kind of a systematic format. So if I ever end up in a Jesus conversation, I would know what I'm going to say. And so we begin to actually practice this in our house. We had the four points and the four points are God loves us. Number two, we have sin in our life, and sin is anything that breaks relationship between us and God. And so now there's a barrier between us and God, the God that loves us. But there's good news. Jesus came, and he gave his life for us. And because of Jesus, we can have relationship with God again. And the fourth point is, would you like to receive that free gift that Jesus offers us? And so we begin to practice this in our house, and our kids were little, and we'd sit around the table, and I'd say, what's the four points of the gospel? Part of it was helping me remember it, but it's also just wanting to instill it into our kids so that as they grew up, they would know what uh, this Jesus was all about and why we follow Jesus. And so I've got a little video I want to show you. This is of my oldest son. Aiden's now 14 years old, but this is 10 years ago when he was about four. And we're sitting at the dinner table, and Daddy asked him the question, hey, Aiden, share the gospel with me. Turn your attention to the screen. Number one, uh, Jesus loves us. Number two, we're a sinner. Number three, we died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And number four, um, we want to have a relationship with God. And what is that? Jesus. No, I know, but what did, what did you just tell me? Uh, the four points of the... Uh, passport. <laughs> The gospel. Yeah, it was messy. It was, it was crazy. You can hear my daughter kind of screaming in the background, but that was just dinner for us. It was, hey, do you, we talk about Jesus all the time, Aiden, but do you know why that's important? And we were beginning to instill in them, even before they could fully grasp all of what it was, what it meant to follow Jesus. I remember when I was a kid, someone one time asked me the question, if you were to stand before God today and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? I remember being like, I have no idea. You know, <laughs> don't ask me that. I'm just a little kid. I, so I was like, I don't want my kids to ever get scared by that question. What would our response be? Why, why do we believe that we have the ability to live in relationship with God? And it boils back down to these four points, which we call the four points of the gospel. And so here's what I want to do. I want to share with you very practically this morning. If you've taken notes, I would encourage you to jot these notes down of how you could share the gospel. If I were to meet you at Starbucks this week, and we were to get into a gospel conversation, and I wasn't sure where you were on the journey of following Jesus, or you were to ask me that question, Van. You've talked about Jesus. Tell me what that looks like. What does it look like to follow Jesus? I'd pull out a napkin at Starbucks, and I'd get out a pen, and here's what I would begin to write on the napkin. I'd say, well, man, the first thing you need to know is that there's a God, and he knows you, and he loves you so much. It doesn't matter what you've done. Right where you are, you are loved. And the two scriptures that I would give them, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have eternal life. John 10, 10, where Jesus says, hey, there's an enemy in this world, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life, life in abundance. Some translations say life in overflow. Man, do you want that? Do you want to have life in abundance? Do you want life in overflow? Do you know the love of God in your life? And then I go to the next page, which is we begin to draw. That's why we call it the bridge diagram. But there's a problem. There's a gap between us and God. And uh, this gap has been here since the beginning of time where men and women decided to go their own way. 
We've made our own decisions and we've, we've gone after the knowledge of good and of evil. And as hard as we might try to do the right thing, as hard as we try to get away from the guilt and the shame on the inside of us, we keep falling short. Or as some people said, that looks like you're urinating into a pit. But either way, <laughs> either way, it's not a good thing. You're just into the wind, man. You're not making it, right? You're not getting across the gap. Sorry, someone in the first service said that, so I thought I'd just mention it to you for your listening pleasure this morning. Make sure you're paying attention. So there's a gap between us and God, a God who loves us. But because of sin in our own life, as hard as we might try, we can never build a bridge to God. We try all sorts of things. We try good works. We try throwing a few dollars in the offering plate. We can try and try and try, but we always end up falling short. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short every time, no matter how hard we try. And then Romans 6.23 says, there's actually a, a penalty. There's a wage for this sin, and that wages of sin are death. It's death. It, every, all the things that we try to get closer to God actually just end up in futile failure. And the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And one of the things that I love uh, to just to point out about this, this whole experience is that, man, so why is that? Why, why, is, why is it that even though I do good things, doesn't that make me a good person? Shouldn't that earn some credit with God? But I want you to think about something. When you see on TV elderly people that have been taken advantage of or abused or kids that have been abused, there's something on the inside of you that says, that's not right. Justice needs to be done there. That's, that's not right. And it's the same way when a holy God looks at you and me. Maybe we haven't done something that we would say is horrendous, but there is sin on the inside of all of us, guilt and shame, toxic waste that builds up on the inside of us. It's the exact same thing. God says, I love you, but justice has to be done here. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and that's where we turn the page. And we say, there's good news, though, about this bridge where we couldn't bridge the gap. But God, because of his love for us, he bridged the gap by sending his son who would die on a cross for us. And the cross is that justice that had to be paid. You and I, there, a price had to be paid for our sin. In fact, in the Old Testament, the way that they did this is the priests would lay their hands on a spotless lamb. And they would, trans, they would transfer the sins of the people to that animal. And then that animal would be killed as a symbolic gesture of putting off those sins. But... You and I know, and they knew, that's a broken system. That doesn't work. We're not animals. We're people. And so God sent his son to live among us as a man, and he lived a perfect life. He was a spotless lamb. We sing songs about this, the lamb of God. And as a perfect God, as a spotless lamb, he went to the cross for us. Romans 5, 8 says that God loved us so much in this that while we were yet sinners, while we were still over here, Jesus died for us, that he would give his life for us. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus went to the cross, and he spilled his blood, and we sing songs where we talk about being washed in the blood, and that's, that's kind of some weird language if you're not familiar with the story of Jesus, but that's where the, those hymns come from. That's where that verbiage comes from, the Lamb of God who gave his blood. Literally, it says that when he was on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was in that moment that sin was taken off of us, our junk, things that are our fault, things that we've done wrong, to break relationship with God and to hurt others and to hurt ourselves. He took all of that on himself and in that moment was cut off from God and died a perfect sacrifice so that we then had that free relationship with God so that we, through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, can enter into relationship with God again. And so then on this fourth point, I then pose the question. I say, would you like to walk across this bridge? Would you like relationship with God? Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I love that verse because it's the, the two parts, the Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. What are you doing when you're doing that? When you say, Jesus is Lord, you're saying, I'm not. I can't get across this bridge. There's nothing I can do. I'm not God. Wish I was. Wish I could figure that out, but I'm not that smart. I'm not that good. I'm not God. Jesus is Lord. 
So when you confess Jesus as Lord, you're also confessing that you're not Lord and that you're putting him in that place. And then the second part, and then if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, let, let me just remind us here, because I know some of us grew up in the Bible Belt and may not remember some of these pieces. Him rising from the dead, what we celebrate on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. This is not some bedtime story that Grandmama made up. This is not a fairy tale. This is a historic event that happened. There was a man named Jesus that lived, and there's eyewitnesses' accounts in the scriptures and outside of, of scripture. He appeared to over 500 people on 11 different occasions that we have record of after his death. And we know he was dead. It says he was stabbed with a spear, and the spear was pulled out, and it said it looked like what blood and water flowed out. We know today medical evidence that the clot and the serum had separated. He was dead on the cross. He was put in a tomb three days and then he rose from the dead and had fish tacos on the beach with his followers. Ghosts don't eat fish tacos on the beach with their followers. Hallucinations don't eat fish tacos on the beach with their followers. He was alive. And so we've always said this, that anybody who can uh, predict their death, burial, and resurrection and actually pull that off, let's go with that guy. Let's go with what, with what he's saying. This is a historic event that happened. And so then Revelation 3.20 says it this way, that Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. He's knocking on all of our hearts and all of our lives. Church people, not church people, good people, bad people, it doesn't matter where you come from. Jesus says, I'm knocking at the door to your life and if you'll open up the door, I will come in. I will come in and I will have fellowship with you. And so as I'm sitting across the table at Starbucks, I just simply say, man, would you like that? Where are you standing on this spectrum? Are you already over here with God or are you standing over here? And it's just so amazing when I've had the opportunity to get to that place where someone has said, hey man, just break it down for me real simple. Tell me the, the nuts and bolts of what this whole Jesus thing is all about and to draw this bridge diagram and to say, would you like to do this? And would you like to walk across this bridge through Jesus and to have him say, yeah, I'd love to do that. How do I do that? Well, it's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that summarizes these four points. God's love for us our need for a savior, the sacrifice that he made on the cross, and then us just responding with a yes, Jesus, we love you. And so this morning, I'd love to just lead you in a prayer as well. Maybe you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer. Maybe you're here today and you've prayed that prayer a long time ago, and um, just today's a day to reaffirm that you can have relationship with God. But if you're here in this room and you're like, man, I want that. I, I'm tired of trying my own ways. I'm tired of falling down, trying to work my way to God. I'm trying to pull off some magic trick of getting things right with God. I, I want to trust Jesus today. If you want to do that, I'd love to just lead you in this prayer. So if you just bow your heads with me wherever you are, it's an invitation to everybody in the room. If everybody just bow their heads and pray along with me. But specifically if you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer of saying, God, I want to trust you. I want to walk across the cross into relationship with God. As I pray out this prayer of sorry, thank you, please, you can just follow along in the quietness of your own heart. And just maybe pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that while we were yet sinners, you gave your life for us. And Jesus, we are so sorry for the things that we've done, the, the things we've done intentionally and unintentionally that have broken relationship with you and have hurt others and have hurt ourselves. We take responsibility for those things today, but we, we also say thank you, Jesus, that you made a way when there was no way. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross that washes us clean. It is so precious, your sacrifice, God. Thank you for that sacrifice. Would you please come into my life today. I, I open the door, with whatever that looks like. I may not even fully understand how all that works, but I just open the door today and I say, I trust you. I say that you are Lord. I put my trust in you, my belief in you. And I ask you to come in. I want to know you. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit today? And would you guide me in what it looks like to be a follower of you? I give my life to you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen.